the occasion of the 13th of Vondemir, Miron commanded one of the divisions of artillery which defended the convention, notwithstanding the entreaties of a great number of his acquaintances and of the persons composing his society. I asked him whether the government might rely upon him. Yes, answered he. I have sworn to maintain the Republic. I belong to the armed force and shall obey by obeying my chiefs. I am, besides by principle, an enemy to all revolutionists and quite as much to those who only adopt their maxims and proceedings in order to reestablish the throne as to those who would bring back that cruel system under which my father and my family have so long suffered. And, in fact, he behaved very gallantly and was extremely useful in that engagement, which saved liberty. I had selected him to be my aide-de-camp at the commencement of the campaign of Italy. He rendered most essential services in almost every action and died gloriously at last on the field of battle. At our coal, leaving a young widow, eight months gone with child, in consideration of the services he had rendered in the different campaigns of this war, I asked that the name of his mother-in-law should be erased from the list of emigrants on which it had been inscribed, although she had never left France. And I claimed the same act of justice in favor of his brother-in-law, whose name had been registered in the fatal list when he was only 14 years old, whilst at Bradford's education. From the men who had contributed to his victories, the emperor passed to the consideration of the movements and combinations which had decided them. These form a series of conceptions, maneuvers, and proofs of intrepidity, of which no other example is to be found in the annals of history. In three years, he had conquered all the northern part of Italy, opposed with about 30 or 40,000 men the greatest efforts of Austria, and made six campaigns. First campaign, Bonaparte draws General Beaulieu under the walls of Genoa, attacks him on his flanks, outflanks his right, defeats him at Montanotti, marches alternately to Dago and Mondavi, drives Beaulieu to Milan, called Turin, reduces the king of Sardinia to submit. Passes the bridge at Lodi, takes possession of Lombardy, crosses the Mincio, besieges Mantua, and in less than two months, from the mountains of Genoa, plants his flag on those of Tyrol, traverses Illyria, and appears on the confines of Germany. The impression of surprise produced all over Europe by these brilliant achievements is not yet forgotten. The parties in France and our enemies abroad describe this general, 26 years old, as a rash-headed young man whose very presumption would cause his ruin and confusion. Subsequent events showed what reliance was to be placed on their predictions. Second campaign. The first effect of these signal advantages was to oblige Worms or to evacuate Alsatia and cross the Rhine with 40,000 men to come to the assistance of Tyrol. This general arrives on the Adige with 80,000 men, takes Montebaldo, penetrates through the Valley of Sabia, and reaches Verona and Brescia at the same time. To this new and formidable enemy, we could only oppose 30,000 men, having to preserve a conquest and to besiege Mantua, which was not the point of surrendering though it contained a garrison of upwards of 8,000 men. In this second campaign, it is that Bonaparte shows himself superior to Frederick, who had been in a similar situation. He does not obstinately persist in the siege of Mantua, as the king of Prussia had done with that of Prague, but supplying the inferiority of his numbers by the resources of his great genius and the celerity of his movements, he... His resolutions and his operations follow each other with the same rapidity and entirely disconcert the enemy who never could find the French army at daybreak where he had left it at the beginning of the night. These bold and beautiful conceptions were crowned by the battles of Lenato and Castiglione and Wormser, defeated in spite of his numerous cavalry, returned to the passes of Tyro, leaving great part of his army in the hands of the French in all these movements, which will present matter for useful meditation to those who follow the career of arms. Bonaparte showed that very often the best means of defense consists in attacking, and that the art of conducting a war on a large scale lies chiefly in being able to regain the liberty of option when it has been lost by the first 
Robert's success of the enemy. His reputation was now established all over Europe. All the French generals acknowledged him as their master. And the old companions of Frederick from that moment proclaimed him to be the hero worthy of bearing the scepter of war unappropriated since Frederick's death, third campaign. Bonaparte had conquered, but having had to contend with the greatest difficulties, he preserved a lively feeling of resentment. He recollected that Worms, sir, had more than once occupied his headquarters, and he did not consider himself sufficiently avenged by the destruction of his plans and a part of his army. He heard that that general had received reinforcements and had marched from Tyrol on the Brenta. Bonaparte immediately proceeded up the Adige towards Riveredo, defeated half the Austrian army, advanced towards Lavis, made a feint to march on Innsbruck, and suddenly extended his operations along the Brenta. The dispositions of the Austrians were useless. He triumphed over every obstacle. Bonaparte attacked and defeated the enemy, pursued him closely, and drove him on the Adige, which he crossed before him. Vermser was on the point of laying down his arms, but one of those chances which baffle all calculations enabled him to effect his retreat, and he went and shut himself up in Mantua with 10,000 cavalry, several regiments of cuirassiers, his staff and baggage. The execution of these movements was so rapid and the defeat so complete that Austria was not apprised of these disasters until she heard by public report that she no longer had an army of Italy, that her frontiers were quite unprotected, and her general shut up in the only place that remained in his possession. It is easy to observe that in these bold maneuvers, Bonaparte had not left anything to chance, and although his marches at first view excite surprise it is soon perceived that a retreat is secured and the measures to be adopted in case of a reverse decided upon military men will notice with a deep interest the numerous and frequent points of resemblance between this campaign and that of the army of reserve in both they will find bonaparte maneuvering upon the enemy's line of operations, placing himself between the enemy's troops and his magazines, intercepting his retreat and deciding at one blow the fate of the whole army. Fourth campaign, it will be easily conceived how much the court of Vienna must have felt irritated by these repeated reverses. Austria was aware that Bonaparte had only a handful of men, and she resolved to try her utmost to liberate her blockaded field marshal and save Mantua. Alvizi was sent for that purpose at the head of a formidable army. 50,000 men marched through Friuli and 20,000 through Tyrol. We could not oppose so great a force and find it impossible to resist or to preserve a range of country so extensive. The French general only endeavored at first to check the movements of the enemy by various corps of observation which he posted on the Brenta. Alvins, he forced these corps past the Pavia, and Bonaparte was obliged to evacuate the whole tract of country comprised between the Brenta and the Adige at Caldero. He endeavored to resume the offensive, but his efforts were unsuccessful, and he besides received information that some of the enemy's divisions occupied the right bank of the river and had already reached Rivoli. Italy now appeared irretrievably lost, and the raising of the siege of Mantua inevitable. The army was mustered at Verona and was found to consist of only 15,000 men capable of bearing arms. These defiled in the dark of the evening, and everyone thought we were continuing to effect our retreat. But this was not the case. The troops were ordered to move on the Adige, which they crossed at 2 o'clock in the morning. And Bonaparte gave the celebrated Battle of Arcole, although the chief object he had in view had failed from the commencement of the action. This skillful maneuver procured him the advantage of forcing the enemy to evacuate the fine position of Caldero and driving him amongst the marshes where he was compelled to fight upon the dikes by which means the advantage of the superiority of his numbers was greatly diminished. His divisions, beaten one after the other and discouraged, fled from the field of battle and threw themselves in disorder behind the Brenta. Bonaparte, having constantly rallied victory round our standard, 
the public, who frequently judge only by results, had perhaps thought that all his plans had constantly been successful, such a supposition would be very erroneous. The best concerted measures have often turned against him, but nobody was more prompt or more skillful in substituting others in place of those that had failed and in obliging fortune again to become favorable fifth campaign in this fifth campaign were fought the battles of rivoli and la favorite which led to the possession of mantua the first of these battles was more glorious for our army than that of marengo since with eighteen thousand men we defeated forty thousand of which twenty thousand were taken prisoners with such an inferiority in numbers and on a field of battle of only five square leagues. It was particularly in this action that the chief of the army displayed the great art of showing his superiority on every point of attack. He could not, on a surface of only seven or eight leagues, or in an interval of 36 or 48 hours, outmarched the Austrian columns, but he defeated them one after the other, although they were only distant from each other for a few hundred toises. The issue of these brilliant affairs of Rivoli and La Favorite was the consequence of a perfect knowledge of the field of battle, of a rare sagacity in penetrating the plans of the enemy, and of an unequal degree of promptitude in devising the means of counteracting them. At Rivoli, the division of the enemy selected to turn the French army arrived accordingly at the position it was directed to take, but it only arrived after the other division had been defeated and was surrounded and reduced to lay down its arms. Sixth campaign. Master of Mantua Bonaparte marched on Rome, taking with him only 5,000 men and signed the Treaty of Tolentino, whilst Europe still thought him beyond the Apennines, disregarding the vain glory of making a triumphal entry in the capital. He loses not a moment, joins his army once more on the Piava, and commences his sixth campaign. In this campaign, after having in less than two months defeated the Archduke Charles on the Tagliamento, on the Isonzo, and at Tarvis, after having crossed the Julian Alps, the Drava, the Sava, and the mirror, he obliges the House of Austria to conclude a peace. He was Master Triest of Istria, Carniola, Corinthia, Styria, and of a great part of Austria. He was in a situation to cause the voice of humanity to be listened to. Our troops had penetrated to the gates of Vienna. Belgard and Merfeld hastened to his headquarters to implore him to grant a suspension of arms. Bonaparte consented, and as they were discussing the limits of the corps of Generals Bernadotte and Joubert, where do you think, General, said he, that Bernadotte is? Pacifume? No, he is in my drawing room, and his division is half a mile from here. And Joubert, where do you suppose him to be? Perhaps at Innsbruck, if indeed he has been able to oppose the column of grenadiers that is marching from the army of the Rhine. Well, he is also in my drawing room, and his troops are marching after him. These two answers surprised the Austrians, and the more so as their general had just sent considerable detachments to defend the provinces of Carniola and Tyrol, through which he thought Generals Bernadotte and Joubert were to pass. Thus, whilst the enemy was dividing his forces, Bonaparte had concentrated in a space of about six square leagues the whole of his troops, amounting to 46,000 men, campaigns of Egypt and Syria. Shortly after peace had been concluded, Bonaparte sailed for Egypt. He appeared before Malta, and the influence of his name, the confidence inspired by his intervention, and the vigor of his attack disconcerted the enemy who surrounded the place, which had never before been taken. Having landed in Egypt, he was once perceiving what kind of warfare is adapted to the country estimated the value of the troops by which it is defended and prepares the tactics the most proper to be adopted the battle of the pyramids at the gates of cairo and of mount tabor in the heart of syria and that of abakir are all three of a different character of conception he maneuvers with unequaled skill and applies to circumstances as new as they are varied all the resources of the art of war. Whilst these events are passing in Egypt, our armies were beaten at Stokak 
and on the Adige, we had conquered Zurich, but Italy was lost to us, and our armies discouraged and without combination, either in their plans or in their movements, had ceased to be the terror of the enemies of France. Civil war raged in our western and southern departments. Factions were tearing each other to pieces, and an imbecile government vainly sought to ensure its safety by fomenting divisions. Campaign of the Army of Reserve. Bonaparte arrives from Egypt. Hope returns. Expectations are revived. The events of the 18th Brumaire justify those expectations and everything rallies round or yields to the genius that conceives, the power that directs, and the moderation that restores confidence. But it is not enough to bring back order by the power of laws. Peace must be conquered by victory. When Bonaparte was appointed first consul, we had just lost the last place we possessed in Italy. Connie, our posts had fallen back on the summit of the Alps. We had not an inch of ground or a single place in Italy. All Germany was evacuated. We acted on the defensive and occupied the places on the left bank of the Rhine. The western departments were up in arms. Our enemies were everywhere. Formidable ready to invade our frontiers and change the destinies of the state. But Bonaparte took the direction of affairs. We once more crossed the Rhine, passed the Alps, and the coalition, beaten and humbled, was reduced to accept the peace.